we'll go ahead and get started so that Sunny has all of her time to talk with you. This is the section on population health and digital data collection. And our presenter is uh, Sunny Lou Williams. And Sunny is the Vice President of Business Development for Telemon in Carmel, Indiana. And um, Sunny earned a Bachelor of Liberal Arts from Purdue University. She was a Hansard Scholar at the London School of Economics. And she received an MBA from Indiana University's Kelly School of Business. Welcome. Thanks, Rosanne. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk loudly, so if you have any trouble hearing me, just let me know. We're going to do a different thing today on the conversations regarding population health. I, unfortunately, am not a clinician. I am a part-time technologist. <laughs> Mostly what I am is a marketer looking at the healthcare landscape and how we actually attract and bring in digital data collection tool sets. So we're going to do the presentation today in actually three parts. The first part is going to be defining for everyone in the room what population health means to us from a technology and marketing perspective. Then we're going to go through some case studies followed by my colleagues Mary Giesel and Nikita Boyd on how population health is actually being actioned on here in our state. And then we're going to redefine what we understand today as far as population health and how we collect data by looking at the trends in data and looking at the overall evolution of how that data impacts further processes and collection of data in the healthcare space. We are interactive. I know we've got an hour. But if there are pressing questions, please ask. And we're going to do this in a much of dialogue and interactive format. So the first thing that we're going to define, because population health is a broadly contextualized vocabulary, is what is population health in the context of this presentation? Population health to us, us as technologists, us as individuals working within the healthcare workflow, is really four things, programs, systems, health overall, and services. So when we look at programs, we're talking about designing programs in such a way that the data input is captured in a holistic manner. When we talk about systems, we're actually talking about technology tool sets, and then how that tool set can look at trending analysis and overall access to that data as it's being captured in real time, and as it's being expanded to support the program over review and analysis of that information. When we look at the health aspect of it, we're really talking about health status and analysis of that data to understand a balance sheet capture in time of what that program is really resulting in based upon the inputs, the individuals, the patients, the community members, whomever it is that you are measuring as part of the program. And then finally, we look at it as how do we take data to better the overall service, the service in the form of how do we extend this program? If I'm screening a population and the population gives me results from the questions I ask about, do you have primary care physician? Do you have insurance today? Have you heard of hip What are we doing then to follow up with the answers resulting from those questions? Are we driving action? Are we driving additional extension programs to offer the education and offer the follow-up information to that particular screening event program? So as we define what population health means to us from a program all the way through to a services extension side, let's step back one step and to take a look at what is how is population health being measured today? In the Academy of Health, uh, we look at really a core determinants of how health is, population health is measured. We look at various factors, various policies and programs, and various impacts from standard living, overall quality of life, et cetera, et cetera. What I want you to take away from today's discussion on population health is simply two things on the measurement of population health. One, how is it measured inside of the healthcare delivery system? Lots of EMRs, lots of technologies, lots of tool sets, an interface basically for every role, data inputs, and data elements of the thousands, and more workflow that you can ever imagine. Okay? Now, conversely, how do you capture 
information outside of that healthcare delivery system. If we go from a comprehensive EMR capability with every department workflow mapped into a system to our extension into the community as still being paper, we've got a huge gap. And if we can't bring that together, then we're not really coalescing all of the digital data, all of the data points, digital aside, all of the data points that we're tracking and capturing when we look at programs like population health nursing, community paramedicine, public health fair screening events, et cetera, et cetera. We need to have an understanding of the population health measurement side of how those ancillary touch points are brought back in and how we lead that community member and that individual through a population health interaction back into the traditional healthcare delivery system. So always look at it as a uh, role of where are we today within the healthcare system and where are we today outside of the healthcare system and what are those gaps in data collection and overall digitization of the work that we're doing. When we look at population health segmentation, this is, uh, this should be, maybe the color coding is not very familiar, but this is also from the Academy of Health, where we look at segmentation of population health being in the medical care component, patient-centered medical home, the traditional healthcare delivery system, and then the prevention and health promotion aspect of it, everything else, right? When we look at this, we say, how do you actually organize programs when we have to address everything else. This is pathogenic, disease state, protocol driven, in some cases linear as far as the following of that protocol, in many cases um, an if-then or a derivative based upon the care teams that are involved and comorbidities that are involved. But in this, this is really, how does that person live their life? So how do you capture this from a population <laughs> health perspective and then provide the supply and demand and projection results into the medical care. Well, we're not the answer, but we are one answer as we look at this. When we look at the community partnerships and population health model, which is a concept that Taiwan has defined, it is how do we take resources today that are both clinical and non-clinical in nature, and how do we extend them into the community? How do we capture that data set how do we look at the population and the community overall? And how do we connect that back into the traditional medical system? And when we look at the patient-centered medical home model in these facility-based organizations, we now need to think about the prevention and health promotion model in these organization <coughs> outreach resource-based. This is predominantly Resources interacting with community members in need, patients in need. This is predominantly facilities interacting with those organizations from a first point of entry. These are individuals that are community health workers, advocates within their communities that are non-clinical. These are individuals that are part of a traditional system that is providing the overall structure to support the diagnosis, treatment, follow-up, etc. So how do we link these two models together to account for a comprehensive population health model that allows for both digital collection at the site of the community interaction into the site of the traditional medical treatment interaction? Well, we look at in our integration how we really turn digital data collection if we look at collecting that data within the prevention and health promotion aspect, bringing that all together and essentially creating a referral queue of actionable data, linking it back into the traditional health system. This is in the form of screening, surveying, and resource support from a nonprofit education and outreach. We have a significant number of nonprofit organizations in the state of Indiana that are funded by Indiana State Department of Health and other uh, commissions and agencies, which Nikita will talk about in a little bit, that their primary role is to outreach the community, provide education awareness on specific disease states, or to outreach to specific populations in health disparity context. If those organizations are screening, should we not take that data set and actually account for 
action back into the health system since those organizations' roles are not to treat and diagnose, but to provide awareness and education. And through their advocacy to that community, don't we have that an excellent opportunity to convert that community member into a patient based upon the data sets provided and the additional education from a cultural context perspective to support that individual community member understanding how to appropriately use the health system and seeking the care that they need. We also have lots of other organizations here, nonprofit community care providers, mental health providers, basic needs assistance support, and of course insurance enrollment and eligibility determination that really gets that uh, financial wheel turned to be able to provide the services and support to the community. In that environment, all of this is actionable data linking back to care and resulting in a converted community member into an acquired patient within the system providing for overall diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up care with not only the care team, but the population health group as part of that support in support of social services, other basic needs, and general education and context that perhaps a clinician is not the best resource or skill set to impart, but rather a social worker, a nonprofit advocate, et cetera, which is providing that information overall to give that context. When we look at this, all the aspects of what we're doing today, we're really addressing four areas. And those four areas, as uh, identified within the, the uh, schedule for today, is really how do we continue to approach the challenges of consumer health literacy, patient engagement, clinical research adoption, and overall next-gen clinicians. If we look at each and every single issue on its own, it is an enormous undertaking. But if we can look at it from a perspective of programs, designing a program in outreaching to the community, designing an overall workflow on how that data should be encapsulated, and then identifying the services that roles outside the traditional hospital system can undertake to support that traditional hospital system, we really get an environment where we're thinking about each of these challenges in a new and unique way and bringing in all of the ancillary groups that are supporting population health and bridging the data and the work that they're already doing into supporting the overall prevention health promotion aspect of the community partnerships and population health model. So what if, in these ideal circumstances, we had consumers that read health education tips daily and acted upon that? What if we had patients engaged and that engagement meant actual behavior change? What if clinical research findings were adopted into practice real time? And what if clinicians had access to all patient interactions at home, at hospital, et cetera? In the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you that that's happening. It's happening in this state, and it's happening with nonprofit providers partnering up with health systems, and it's happening in new and innovative programs where we look at what is consumer health literacy, but marketing to the consumer over and over and over again. Today, when you're marketed to, typically the marketing is a buy action, right? It's not really anything else except buy this, support this, etc. Well, what if we did consumer marketing in a new way where the action wasn't buy, but the action was do. Do what? Market it in education in such a way that that community member is now incentivized and engaged as just part of having that dialogue. And instead of a buy action, we talk a lot about consumer healthcare spending, instead of that buy action, we're really talking about a do. What is that next step that you have to take? When we look at patient engagement, how do we actually change behavior if the interaction with the traditional hospital system may be at minimum annually for a primary care appointment, or maybe even less than that because so few individuals are actually going in and leveraging primary care? Well, if we're not having that conversation inside of the traditional health system, let's bring the conversation out of the health system and have that conversation in a new environment. So when we look at a catchphrase called primacy of place, it's about how do you have that conversation 
in a new environment, in a new facility, in a new interaction that permits a comfortable conversation about healthcare that is not specific at the healthcare facility. Know that the first two things that we're going to talk about as far as our case studies within population health management that, again, are happening here in the state of Indiana with organizations that are here, outreaching to the community and linking back into the hospital environment. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Nikita Boyd. Nikita oversees our population health segment, and she's been working with nonprofits within the state and interacting with them on how they are creating awareness and educational linkages back to care and how consumer health literacy directed towards those health disparity populations and populations in general and how patient engagement in a new environment, a new primacy of place is being conducted. I feel welcome, Nikita, with me. Oh, I just said all those things, so we're just going to skip that. <laughs> so we're going to talk about consumer health literacy and patient engagement in the area that Nikita is talking about. Um, I'll just come up here. I can talk louder, but I'm not going to strain it because I'm cold. <laughs> um, Sonny talked about the community partnerships in population health model um, and looking at specifically population health. So trying to understand what all was entailed in the population health. So I'm going to borrow from an earlier presentation on a definition, a level set for what population health is. And that speaker said that population health um, can be defined as delivering the right care to the right person at the right time and in the right setting. And I love that definition of population health. So in the CPPH model, what we're trying to attempt to do is take a look at the community at large as our population. So you can slice and dice that, but we're really looking at those people that are um, may not frequent the traditional health system. So we're trying to reach those folks before they know that they're sick, before they have some sort of episode that brings them to the hospital, before their knee starts hurting and they, um, and they realize that it's swollen because of their hypertension. Uh, that sort of thing. So that's uh, what our focus is um, from a community partnerships and population health model. So uh, we're trying to reach also those, those folks from a population standpoint that um, may be a minority population, refugee, immigrant populations here, um, which are big here in the state of Indiana, um, who may not have English as their first language. Um, the uninsured and underinsured or underserved populations, as well as those that um, relatively feel healthy, which is the category of everyone else, who relatively feel healthy so they don't utilize their health insurance. So that's what, um, when Sonny mentioned that I oversee the population health segment, that's the segment that, that we're going to be looking at. Um, so we want to reach them with programs. That's part of population health. So the programs piece is the outreach to at the right time in the right places. So we want to go to where those folks are because they obviously are not coming in to the health systems. So we want to uh, take a look at um, our outreach programs. We also want to uh, use systems of measurement. So that system of measurement is going to help us to digitize data collection, basically and help us to provide that information back to the traditional health systems. So if this person is um, from an outreach program, um, may have some more, uh, may have some health needs that need to be addressed by a clinician, then um, the systems that we're using for that data capture can provide that data to that health system. So when that person comes in, they don't have to remember what their blood pressure or blood sugar was. It, they'll already have that information available to them in the health system. So that's using our systems. Uh, using uh, also with the systems is the analysis piece. So we want to translate those community outreach programs into actionable data cues. And that's with the, um, the help of analysis. Uh, being able to do those things in real time fashion. 
So um, most health systems utilize data from claims to do risk stratification in those things. How old is that claims data? This person may no longer be having those symptoms and those issues three months, six months, a year later when that, um, when that uh, facility is using that claims data to analyze and stratify their population. So we want to be able to offer real-time uh, actionable cues through our analysis. And then our analysis finally produces more services. So this is a meeting the immediate needs of the population. Um, being able to understand what this particular community needs in order to get them back on a healthy track. Whether that's from a health perspective that can be addressed by the um, traditional health systems or whether it's food deserts or whether it's domestic violence or any of those other services that not, not necessarily directly lend to a person's health, but they don't help a person's health as well. Um, so again, Telemon is focusing on uh, the right care. So uh, with our data collection efforts, um, and then for the right person with our various populations, uh, depending on the clients that we're working with and what their actual population is, and we'll take a look at how they define their populations when we look at those uh, systems. And then uh, the right time, so before hospital visits are necessary, before this person needs to uh, uh, go to the emergency room. And then the right setting, so again, the primacy of place theory, where we're going to where they are because they're obviously not coming in. So we've actually created um, a Telemon uh, proprietary software tool um, called StatWatch, and we equip clinicians, volunteers, community health workers, anyone who is uh, participating in an outreach perspective with the tool sets uh, that they need to digitally capture that data and uh, bring that data back analyze it and then we allow and work with our clients to produce other services or to quantify the services that they're already uh, providing to see how um, how much impact that has on the community and that is the entire cpph community partnerships and population health model is it me again yes yes it is okay so let's look at specifically how our clients are using StatWatch. Um, and this, again, all the clients that we're going to go through today are within the state of Indiana. They are outreach um, focused. They are nonprofits. And they have uh, ties to traditional health systems. Um, so we'll look at a couple of those uh, types of clients and how they're doing uh, digital capture of data today using StatWatch. So the first um, organization that we're going to look at is the Indiana Commission on the Social Status of Black Males, ICSSBM. Every year for the last five years, this might be year six, I believe 2016 will be year six, uh, the ICSSBM sponsors an event where they go to black barbershops in 15 cities across the state of Indiana and they screen educate and refer black men at the barbershop, right where they are. Um, all types of things are discussed at a barbershop. If any of you have ever been to a barbershop or beauty salon, all kinds of things are discussed there. So why can't health also be discussed there? Um, it's a comfortable place, and uh, the gentlemen that frequent those places trust their barber, so they trust the folks that the barber bring in to provide these services. So the, the population that ICSSBM focuses on is uh, black men, all ages, anyone who frequents that barbershop. And the primacy of place, of course, is the barbershop, hence it is the Indiana Black Barbershop Health Initiative. And then their um, data collection and the outreach that they're providing. Uh, so they're really looking at, and these are actual screenshots from our StatWatch system. Uh, STAT is a, a mobile application. It resides on um, a tablet. Uh, and then the watch portion is the um, web-based backend. So these are actual screenshots from STAT and watch. So they're looking at um, uh, screening for BMI, which is weight and height, 
um, with an automatic calculation, blood pressure, and then blood glucose for uh, the black males that frequent those barbershops. And then they take that data back and they uh, run statistics and uh, take a look at what are the health disparities for the African-American male community and what can they do to impact those. So working with health systems, um, what can they do to, uh, to impact specific zip codes, specific cities, whatever the situation may, may be uh, for, those, for this population. And they also refer uh, individuals who may have elevated readings um, directly to those health systems at the time of the event. Another organization that we work with is the Su Susan G. Coleman um, uh, of Central Indiana. Uh, and their mission is uh, working to better the lives of those facing breast cancers breast cancer in the uh, central Indiana community. Um, Indianapolis uh, ranks number 10 out of the 50 largest cities where non-Hispanic um, black African American women face a disparity in, in breast cancer deaths. So Susan G. Coleman uh, of central Indiana joined with other community leaders and also um, traditional health systems within Indianapolis, and they created uh, the Red Alliance, which is reaching to end disparities to address uh, the disparity and mortality rates for African American women in um, regards to breast cancer. So their population is African American women. Their primacy of place, the Red Alliance is, is uh, conducted in churches. So there's 10 churches, um, uh, heavenly frequent, frequented churches in Indianapolis that have breast health advocates. Um, and these ladies are members of that particular church and community. Um, they are either pastor's wives, um, breast cancer survivors themselves, or have been touched by breast health or breast cancer in their own personal lives that have taken the initiative to step up in their church and provide outreach and opportunities uh, to educate women on breast health um, awareness. Uh, so their data collection that they're really looking at is assessments. So they're using StatWatch to um, conduct um, health risk assessments on the congregation. Um, this can be done uh, usually uh, there is a time in October that they call Pink Sundays, which brings lots of awareness to, um, to uh, uh, breast cancer. Um, it can be done uh, basically after morning worship, uh, after Bible study, or, or however they can reach those, those ladies. Or they can have community health fairs at the church uh, where they will screen um, individuals. Um, health risk assessments, give them health risk assessments, and then they use that information based on how those uh, participants answered the questions to create programs and services within the church that the Susan Jean Coleman actually funds for them to provide more awareness. So that's just um, another sampling of how this uh, data collection is being used, how the primacy of primacy of place is being used, and then how the CPPH model is being used. Uh, the last uh, slide here is from the um, Indiana University National Center of Excellence on Women's Health. And uh, the IUCOE has a lot of different focuses, but um, one of their outreach data focuses would be their um, making Healthy Choices statewide outreach program where they take a bus, and that's a picture of the actual bus down there. It's called uh, Women Wellness on Wheels Bus. And they go to different communities um, and they provide screening. In that bus is uh, basically a mobile um, doctor's office. So there's exam rooms, there's bathrooms, and then there's a station for registration. So they use uh, StatWatch on the, on the bus to capture the information 
from um, the women that they're serving. So their population would be any woman of childbearing age. They screen uh, women that are outside of that range, but their primary focus is from childbearing ages, which they define as 14 to 40. So that's amazing. So they can also screen children as well as adults. Um, their primacy of place would be anywhere in the community that they can take the bus and be able to provide those services. If they can get the bus in there, they can do the screening. And then their data collection is looking at uh, individual women. So they're not looking for statistics. They're not looking for um, overall health of a specific population. They're looking at the actual individual. So screening individual women uh, multiple times, creating that history, and then being able to provide uh, health coaching. From the back end system, they capture notes, they um, uh, help schedule appointments at uh, healthcare facilities that they um, are partnered with. They do all those activities and then they coach the person through the interactions um, to take away all of the excuses that we may sometimes use um, when we are uh, trying to uh, not go to the doctor. I think that's my phone. Yes, to take away all the excuses uh, that we use when we don't want to go to the doctor or we never knew anything was wrong. Uh, we don't feel any certain type of way. So even though my blood pressure is elevated, I don't feel like my, I have high blood pressure, so I'm not going to do anything about it. That is their focus and that is their, their purpose is to work with um, women on an individual level to make sure that they're taking care of their health. That is all. literacy, that's really based upon having a human interaction of that community member, of that consumer, with trusted advocates within primacy of place. The barbershops, churches, the good reputation of branding and focus of women's wellness on heels. When we look at that, we're really saying consumer marketing, driving consumer health literacy, needs to be in the format of educational events, wellness interactions, and then also health promotions in a way that is readily addressable and also in a format that people want to listen about, want to hear about, engaging in their social community. We also look at primacy of place where we're really talking about what's an appropriate place, a comfortable place to have that healthcare conversation, to have that dialogue when it could be very difficult conversations regarding breast cancer, health disparities, et cetera, et cetera. In that environment, we have typically outreach to nonprofit organizations to help with the socialization, the education and awareness, and finally, the linkage back into care. In the second two areas that we're going to talk about, we're going to look at how brand new protocols based upon physician authorship and studies are being real time adopted into medical intervention for consumers, and also how the next generation of clinicians from a cl culture of inclusion, also from a skill set review and the efficiency of who at what time should be treating what patient sets. So as we talked about pre-hospital and linking back into care with Nikita's case studies, we're not going to talk about within the hospital, how do you follow up with patient discharge? How do you follow up post-patient discharge when the patient is now leaving the hospital and going back into the home. And to talk about that case study, we're going to invite Mary Diesel, our clinical program manager who oversees our community paramedicine initiatives, to discuss, to discuss the overall community paramedicine initiative and then talk a little bit about how that initiative is a great follow-up into both 100% follow-up on discharge for slated populations and also extension of care. Mary? get myself oriented a bit. So has anybody heard the term mobile integrated healthcare? Anybody heard of community paramedicine? Okay, one, two. Good job. It is relatively new. Um, 
you'll hear me refer to it as MIH or MIHCP, CP meaning community paramedic. What it means is that paramedics uh, in the environment that I'm going to talk about, which is just one case study, um, community paramedicine is being talked about a lot throughout the EMS community, throughout the nation, actually throughout the world. Um, however, uh, as one of the speakers earlier today alluded to, once you've seen one community paramedicine program, you've seen one community paramedicine program. They don't duplicate, at least not to our experience so far. Uh, but it is taking the downtime of paramedics when they're in the firehouse and uh, following up with patients in their home. Residents in their home would be more appropriate. Uh, so the case study, uh, one of the things we did talk about is that you know, once a patient enters the walls of the hospital, we are gathering tons of information about them from the get-go. However, once they go home, we get nothing. You know, we know a little bit. If they're being seen by a home health care agency, we might get some information back. But once they go home, we really don't know anything. We're not collecting any information there. So um, what's really interesting is um, in 1996, um, there was uh, from NHTSA, the National uh, Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration, came up with the EMS Agenda for the Future. This was 1996. And the long story short was it set us up for where we are. Now, that's a boatload of words, so don't worry about it. Uh, this is the only part that really struck me, which is community-based health care management that is fully integrated with overall health care system. So I don't know. I am an old um, cardiac nurse, and I don't know that I ever really considered EMS as part of the health care system. Yes, I realized that they were providing medical care in the field, but I, don't, I sort of segmented that off, and I think in medicine we're really good at siloing. Um, so this is basically stating that they knew back in 1996 that we're all going to have to come together and work together, and we're going to have to acknowledge that in an intentional way. So, and that's it's the redistribution of existing services and resources, and bringing them together. All of us talking to each other, all of us knowing what one hand, the right hand is doing, and what the left hand is doing to ultimately have the best benefit for the patient. So here's the case study. Um, as you heard, Telemann is based in Carmel. And uh, we began quite by accident, really, with the Carmel Fire Department. Give you a little bit of background on the city of Carmel. About 89,000 um, people live there, about 50 square miles of land area. They have their own police department and their own fire department and their own EMS within their fire department. That's kind of noteworthy, and I won't go into the intricacies of it, but that is noteworthy. They have six fire stations in the city and 43 paramedics. In July of 2014, of their own accord and goodwill to the community, they started noticing that they were calling on certain addresses more frequently than other addresses. Um, in fact, when that would come up on the CAD system, uh, we're going back to see Mr. So-and-so at this address. So they started paying attention to those particular addresses. For instance, one of the most common things that they saw was patients that had mobility issues or were at risk for falling. And so they started um, referring within their own department. So Station 46 calls to HQ and says, hey, we've run on this address 10 times in the last two months. Maybe we should follow up on them. So of their own accord, the paramedics, those who raised their hand and volunteered and said, yeah, we'll follow up, went in to see the patients. Um, and went back, called on the, on the person in their home, and said, hi, we're from the fire department. We called on you a little while back, and we're here to follow up and see how things are going. And this is sort of the flow of the work from their own self-generated self-referral. Fire department guys identified them. They sent an email to one of the paramedics that had volunteered to help in this capacity using Microsoft Outlook. This was our documentation at that point. The community paramedic went back through their CAD system or their run reports to find out the information that they could find out for why they went there in the first place, and then they would make a visit. If they had the luxury of a phone number, of course, they would call, but sometimes they didn't always get that luxury. So they would go back and visit the patient. Um, if there were any services that were needed, they would make those referrals to um, community-based organizations, nonprofits, and the like. SOCOA was one of the ones that they used quite a bit. Um, and anything that needed to be documented about that intervention occurred in their Microsoft Outlook emails to each other. At that time, there were about six paramedics that were working in this environment. Um, and then if a, uh, another visit was noted, they put that in the system into the Microsoft Outlook, and whoever was up the next two or three days, maybe next two or three weeks, 
would go and make a follow-up meeting with that pa with that resident in their home. There's no standard documentation other than the paper forms that they used, and that was a, a home uh, safety assessment form. Uh, they would do a medication list form and sometimes come across some issues with medications. Um, and then they would also leave some information for the resident in their home about how to get back in touch with the community paramedics should they need them. That was most of the standardization. So even though not a whole lot was being standardized as far as data capture, they still had some pretty significant success. In a year's time, with their own self-referrals, they saw 85 patients, or residents, forgive me. Um, one success story that's uh, worthy of note is one um, resident was seen 25 times from January to July, so in six months. At $475 a run, because the patient was always transported to the emergency department, that cost came out to be almost $12,000 in ambulance transport cost, um, charges. Once they started visiting the, pay, uh, the resident in their home and started to work with them on the, fr the uh, home safety assessment and the fall risks and so on, there were no more calls made in the subsequent six months. So if we talk about um, where the Affordable Care Act is taking us, uh, from fee for service. Just because I can doesn't necessarily mean I should. In fee for service, well, shoot, we got a call. Let's transport. We're going to pay for it. We're going to get paid for it. And we'll just keep doing that as long as we get, keep getting paid for it. Well, the Affordable Care Act says no more. Um, you have to show us that what, what activity you are doing is going to benefit the person that you're interacting with and that you're going to be intervening with. Quite by accident, we came into the picture, and they had Carmel Fire had asked us to help them extend their project. They wanted to work with the local hospitals. With their first phase, as we refer to it, which was those first 85 patients, the hospital said, well, you don't really have anything to show us other than you're doing this at a goodwill. They weren't getting paid for it. They were doing it just to take good care of their community. So the hospitals were reluctant to get involved. There was no data to say this was a good thing, it was a bad thing. It was just, you know, you all keep doing what you're doing. We're not quite sure we want to go there yet. Through our partnership with them, we were able to put in place um, a different type of EPCR, Electronic Patient Care Record. There's a lot of acronyms, so if I say something you don't recognize, let me know. Currently, in EMS, their EPCRs are very focused on emergency situations. Community paramedicine is not necessarily an emergency situation. It's kind of along the lines of primary care, seeing somebody in their home. So they needed a way to document what was going on with every interaction with that resident longitudinally over time. And of course, the data, data sets that we would need there are completely different than what happens in an emergency call. In an emergency call, they want to know how long did it take you to get from the firehouse to the scene? How long did it take you to get from the scene to the patient? How long did it take before you started to intervene with the patient? What was the patient biometric information at the time they get there? What were their vitals? And so on. Not necessarily the path that we're going down with community paramedicine. So we entered into the next phase of the program, and through the partnership with Telemon and with one of the local hospitals, they decided to run a pilot, which is exactly where we are right now. And it is for um, care of ED patients that present that may not be necessarily sick enough to stay, but doc may want to hold them in the ER for 23 hours for observation. Well, the hospital that they're working with has limited capacity as far as how many patients they can keep. So uh, through work with the medical director of the fire department, who also uh, his medical group functions out of that hospital, um, they came up with this program. We came up with criteria for these patients. Um, and it's left up to the physician to decide if they want to offer what we call the ER observation avoidance protocol, meaning avoiding the patient having to stay in the ED. Maybe they could go home if somebody could just lay eyes on them again in like 12 hours. So this is where community paramedicine is functioning um, using this data capture element, this type of electronic um, documentation, and working with a local hospital. So this is where we are at this point. Um, we're still relatively new with it. The, the fire department is still enrolling their own self-generated patients. But as far as the ER observation avoidance patients, we're still relatively new. We just went live January 4th. So um, they uh, are being able to standardize the form of documentation.
They can communicate within each other as far as, oh, we have to go make a trip to see this patient today. They can go on to the system that they're using. They can communicate using that same system, somewhat like an inpatient EHR. Um, and they can run searches on what's happened and so on and so forth. So it brought some standardization. We're not we're still in the process of learning from the hospital what type of data elements they want to see to track. But that's where we are at the program right now. Um, the impact that we see is pretty obvious from the one success story that I told you as far as patients not needing not being transported to the hospital unnecessarily that if there's a means to keep them at home, they can stay home, which um, as an old nurse, sometimes that's a safer place. If they're not in um, a physical condition that obviously warrants medical intervention. Um, and community paramedics are getting the benefit of something that we in the healthcare environment, meaning hospitals, don't always get to know. How do they live? Where do they live? Do they have food in the refrigerator? How many pills of bo you know, bottles of pills do they have? Some that have expired that they're not supposed to take anymore, yet they still have the bottle on the countertop. Those are the things that this program allows the primary care physician to know because the community paramedicines will also be in contact with their primary care physician. So, it reduces the amount of inappropriate use of the emergency department, inappropriate use of the emergency medical system, better quality of care for those when they do need it, um, and ultimately it is going to have an impact on um, the health of the community. Paramedics are going to be in these people's homes, are going to be knowing what they're seeing more often than not. Is it addiction? Like down in Scott County, is that what they're seeing? Or are they seeing um, issues with mental health? They'll, get a, they'll probably get on the forefront of that, maybe even before we start seeing it on social media because they're in patients' homes. Um, for the fire department, uh, this is what is somewhat unique for this particular program. When they started, they were doing it out of the goodness of their hearts and not being compensated. Their hope is, with our help, that as we are tracking information, tracking data, and can show good outcomes, because we know it's going to happen. I mean, it makes sense. You can keep somebody from going to the hospital, just the risk of falls and being confused and picking up an, a nasty bug from inpatient, and you can keep them at home. We know we're going to have an impact. Not to mention we're going to be ahead of these things, patients with congestive heart failure. If I'm seeing that patient two weeks after they've been discharged from the hospital for congestive heart failure, and I can see that they're starting to get pitting edema around their ankles, it's probably time to call their primary care physician, even though they may not be going back to their primary care physician for a month community paramedic can call and say, I think we might need an extra Lasix here. You know, getting ahead of it so that they're not showing up in the ED or not coming into the primary care physician's office behind the eight ball and in crisis, which is what we're all trying to get to and what the Affordable Care Act is trying to get to, prevention and better health promotion over time. Um, so now I'm done. Thanks for listening. areas of that type of interaction within the home and the delivery system, if you will, of community paramedics is the opportunity to embed new research, new interventions, new questions, new asks into that interaction. So in fact, we partner with academic or institutions here within the state that gives us questions to ask in these environments that may not specifically be PHQ-2 or PHQ-9, but are specific to the types of populations that we are seeing in that community. So it's really an opportunity to increase the knowledge and to repurpose the content in a way that's meaningful for that community. In that respect, from a clinical research adoption, in the state of Indiana, community care medicine and EMS initiatives are driven by a medical director that's typically an ER physician or a internist or a primary care physician to be able to essentially extend his or her license to the appropriate practice of that paramedic within the home or in any area of transport. Within the New England Journal of Medicine, ER physicians have actually banded together to write protocols of pre-hospital, pre-ER interventions to be done by paramedics inside the home prior to transport in an effort to save on transport since the patient can voluntarily uh, identify that they do not want to be transported. A very effective way of using clinical research and also a grouping of uh, overall physician promotion into an actual tried and true intervention environment without the long and lingering steps of actually positioning 
research into mass adoption within the health system. Then we talk about the next generation of clinicians. When we talk about this, you know, some, sometimes there's this hesitation to say, there's licensure for a reason. So why extend that licensure? Well, the reality is today, we don't have the uh, resource skill sets across the board to be in the home and in the community across the existing licenses that we have. Last year, very excitingly, the state of Indiana, through General Assembly, passed that nurses are now identified as a provider group eligible to look to provide intervention and overall cohort management for up to 500 patients at a time. So that is a new legislative establishment here within the state. We, as a state, are actually being looked at and focused on by Centers of Medicaid and Medicare Services as an alternative care model where we are looking at who is the next generation of clinicians to be able to do this support inside of the home and in the community. But what do we all know across the board about CMS? Let's try it, but you gotta have the data for us to pay for it, right? So if we have these opportunities, what can we do to broadly look at the programs, the who, is doing what and how can those whom's collaborate together? Excuse my grammar, I don't know if that whom's who's, etc. But <laughs> how can they collaborate together to then collect the data? We are doing incredible things in the state of Indiana. We are sharing those across the board, but what we're not doing is self promoting to say, this is how we collaborate, this is how we are engineering new programs, this is how we collected the data. Again, Selfishly, we'd love for you all to use our technologies, but at the end of the day, we are only one answer, not the answer. So if you bring that together and you think about how the programs, the data capture, the overall analysis, and how that extension of that service can be met, then we've got a winner. It will tell you across the board in uh, the little over a decade that we've been doing this, if we ourselves never imagined that we would be the facilitator for such a program, such a definition of technology and workflow, and also such an execution of what is the next step, what is the data, and what does the data tell us in promotion of certain services, extension of certain programs, and the overall benefit to the end user. But here we are. So we're going to do it. We're going to continue to do it. But we love to bring everybody in to say, this is very easily facilitated based upon those four steps. And we look at consumer health literacy, patient engagement, clinical research adoption, and also the next generation of clinicians. These are not so much issues today as areas of opportunity on how we can collaborate to resolve. And it's always going to be based upon what is the community that you serve and how is that community responding to the programs in order to define success and effectiveness. So when we look at consumer health literacy, we're really saying, okay, Consumerization of healthcare, taking it to the next level, taking it to the next level, taking it to consumer marketing. We're really consumerizing health. If I, as a patient, as a community member, as an individual, don't know how to make that buying decision, then I'm never going to make it. So from consumerizing health, it's really leading and saying, what's the best way for you to take that action? Not to make that buy, but to do. What does that do that you have to do? When we look at primacy of place on a patient engagement perspective, we're really talking about we're going to stop asking you to keep coming to us. How can we have a healthcare confirmation conversation to excite you about going to primary care, to excite you about using a traditional healthcare system? And that is going to be a conversation where your health should be an everyday, every place conversation, not just a conversation when you think you're sick or when you think you need to go to the health system, or when you go, oh, I need to spend my FSA dollars. Right? That should be an ongoing discussion. The clinical research adoption piece is really about how do we move the amazing academic research or institutions that we have within the state. The content that's being sent out, primarily today for the digestion and review of other clinicians, how do we take that content and mobilize it across the board so that all organizations can be benefited by that content to support the great foundational findings to then extend and evolve health as all of these great data sets and great statistics and information in these trials already 
substantiated and extended out. And then finally, when we look at next generation of clinicians, be, be it defining a licensure, be it de redefining provider, be it even just inclusion of um, community health workers that are not licensed individuals, it's about the open-mindedness of who is reaching out there and how could we leverage that person with more education, better access, more tool sets, so that that next-gen individual, clinician or not, can actually support resourcing better health care to the places and the conversations that those individuals are in. We thank you uh, for your time and also for listening. It was a lot of <coughs> So we'll have our presentation up. We're happy to ask, answer any questions. But as most of this was, well, really quickly, most of this was a action, action, action that we all discussed during our discussion, I want you all collaboratively to homework assignment. You have a do. Go to Twitter, since we talked about social media today, go to Twitter and read the handle at CMS Innovates. At CMS Innovates has just released the Accountable Healthy Communities model, which selfishly we're going to self-promote and say we actually thought of this through community partnerships and population health. The CMS Innovates is going to award 44 communities uh, within the nation a total of $157 million to specifically address what we've talked about today. Awareness, assistance, and alignment. Those of you that are health systems, we're okay with competition. Go after it. Because the state of Indiana needs more and more federal funding to continue the program that we're doing today. There's a webinar on the 27th. Listen to it. The last webinar, 3,000 people across the nation attended it. We need to get there. <laughs> so take a look at that as an action, as learning more about population health as we have defined it, as CMS has validated and now is funding as far as collaborative partnerships across the board to bring better engagement to the residential, consumer, patient. Questions? What did you say? At CMS Innovate. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned Plumlogging. Is that the only place that is doing care medicine in Indiana? Uh, no. Fishers and Noblesville uh, will be closely on board. <laughs> Part of it. I live in a rural area. That seems mm -hmm. like it would be very beneficial for especially in rural areas and uh, all of the Absolutely. Absolutely. So when we look at it from a business market, Mary, please supplement. When we're looking at this from a business marketing perspective, we always talk about channels, right? How are you going to expand and do widespread adoption fastest? Well, fire department infrastructure, they train their own, they know their own, they're accredited, they have the overall governance structure to do that. We, luck and happenstance, yes, the